Good afternoon. I'm Rachel Floor, Executive Director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation, and I'm so pleased to welcome you all to our program. Today marks the launch of our New Frontier Network's monthly conversation series, New Frontier Fridays. The JFK Library Foundation's New Frontier Network aims to reach, inspire, and activate individuals with no living memory of President Kennedy through meaningful program. I want to thank our NFN Steering Committee, co-chaired by Sara Stefani and Terrence Burke for championing President Kennedy's legacy and leading us in developing this conversation series. We hope our New Frontier Fridays will help us to all form connections, find inspiration, and rise to meet the challenges of our time with hope and purpose. I would like to recognize the generous and loyal sponsors who've made the NFN's work possible. John Hancock, Boston Capital, and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. Along with supporting President Kennedy's library, each of these corporations has stepped forward in recent weeks to ask what they can do to protect the most vulnerable in our community. And we are truly honored to count them among our partners. Today, we're privileged to have former Governor Deval Patrick and University of Virginia Miller Center's Director of Presidential Studies, Dr. Barbara Perry, to participate in our kickoff conversation, Courageous Together for a New Frontier. An experienced executive in both the public and private sectors, Governor Patrick has been a leader in developing solutions to the challenges we face together as a community. As governor of Massachusetts from 2007 to 2015, he served in public office during the Boston Marathon bombing and later went on to, find, to found Bain Capital Double Impact. Dr. Barbara Perry, who is currently on sabbatical writing a book about Eleanor Roosevelt and John F. Kennedy, serves on the JFK Library Foundation's Board of Advisors and co-directs the Miller Center's Presidential Oral History Program. Thank you for being here, Governor Patrick and Dr. Perry. I would now like to welcome Dr. Perry to begin our conversation. Rachel, it's great to be with you uh, today. And uh, to Governor Patrick, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule uh, to be with us on this first conversation of New Frontier Fridays. I also want to thank uh, James Jenkins and all my friends at the Kennedy Library for uh, launching this series. Uh, as Rachel mentioned, I'm a, busy at work uh, doing uh, on my sabbatical a book on Eleanor Roosevelt and John F. Kennedy and their political relationship. And uh, because of the uh, coronavirus situation, of course, uh, I'm at home working uh, rather than at the Kennedy Library working. But what's so great about the archives at the Kennedy Library are that many of them are digitized and online. So I'm able to use those resources uh, as I have in person for doing three other books uh, on President Kennedy and the Kennedy family. Uh, so I want to thank all the archivists as well and all those who've been involved in digitizing that material. But I also want to talk about a little bit about the museum at the library because I've brought over the last uh, three summers over 100 teachers from around the country uh, to learn about President Kennedy at the museum at the library and also to check in with its wonderful education department uh, so that they can take the lessons of President Kennedy and his history and the time in which he served uh, back to their classrooms and to a new generation, as Rachel mentioned. Uh, so with that, um, I've been asked to talk just a few minutes before I turn to Governor Patrick and his expertise on times of crisis. I asked to talk a little bit about the themes for today, which are uh, Courageous Together, uh, and the new frontier. So in other words, we're gonna be courageous together uh, as we set out on new frontiers. And so every time I think about courage, I think uh, not only about how President Kennedy was able to exhibit that courage throughout his life, uh, but also about uh, his Pulitzer Prize winning book, Profiles in Courage. And I turn always to the very last paragraph of that book in which he said, to be courageous requires no exceptional qualifications no magic formula, no special combination of time, place, or circumstance. It is an opportunity that sooner or later is presented to us all. And then he ends by saying that stories of past courage can define that ingredient of courage, and they can teach, and they can offer hope, and they can provide inspiration, but they cannot supply courage itself. For this, all of us must look into our own souls. And so I'm not sure whether we're going to be quite that spiritual today, but we're certainly going to be thinking about the different approaches to courage. And it also made me think about the phrase that uh, I knew someone famous had said, and when I looked it up, it turned out to be Franklin Roosevelt. And it was that courage is not the absence of fear, 
but rather the assessment that something is more important than that fear. And combining that with Nelson Mandela, who also said that courage is not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it, I then went forth to, to think in terms of Eleanor Roosevelt, who said, uh, as always, very down to earth she was, you must do the thing you think you cannot do. And so if we think about that concept of courage as we embark on new frontiers, that phrase was coined by President Kennedy uh, in 1960. So it's been um, 60 years ago. Uh, this coming July at his acceptance speech at the Democratic Presidential Convention in Los Angeles, as he stood at California and he said, we, we've come across the country from east and west uh, and we've, we've conquered uh, the, the landmarks, we've conquered those challenges as we spread across the country. But he said, now we look to space and we look to the moon and the stars and science and medicine. And we look to the challenges that we have on this earth to try to conquer uh, poverty and bring health care to everyone and to help farmers and to help those who live in the cities and to improve education. And I would say that we need to take that courage and we wanna think about in these times of sometimes social isolation as we are being taught to engage in right now, how can we be courageous together as we embark on new frontiers and particularly for this challenge that we face both uh, in the world of medicine and certainly economics uh, because of the coronavirus. Um, so with that, I wanna to turn to our special guest today, uh, Governor Patrick, and uh, talk to him a little bit uh, to start off with about uh, a special challenge that he faced uh, in his time as governor of the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And that was what turned out to be the war on terror was brought directly to the streets of the beautiful historic city of Boston uh, during its annual signature athletic event, the Boston Marathon in 2013. And so governor, tell us how you approach what I'm sure you thought was something that might never happen. Perhaps we could have thought in terms of terrorism coming to our shores. We had already seen it with 9-11. Many in Boston and Massachusetts uh, were affected by that terrible attack on 9-11. Uh, but when you heard about the bombing, what were your initial thoughts? And tell us how you met that challenge, that new frontier with courage. Well, uh, first of all, Barbara, thank you very much for, uh, uh, for moderating uh, this conversation. Thanks to all who have tuned in to follow it. I hope uh, we can provide uh, in these few minutes uh, the same kind of encouragement uh, or a modicum of the encouragement that I take from the quotes from, Rose from the Roosevelt's and from President Kennedy that you, uh, that you opened with. I thank uh, Rachel as well for her leadership and James for the invitation to be a part of this uh, today. I remember the day the bombs went off at the Boston Marathon, uh, Barbara, as an uncommonly um, an unseasonably warm and sunny day. You're sitting in Charlottesville right now, so you, you may not appreciate that in mid-April, it can still be pretty chilly uh, in these parts. And uh, it was just a marvelous day, not a cloud in the sky, as I recall. And I went by the hospital that morning to visit then Mayor Menino, who uh, had been ho hospitalized for a little while then and was not going to be at the marathon as he always was. And his traditional duty was to crown the male elite runner and the governor's is to, is to crown the uh, female elite uh, winner. And he couldn't come and he asked if I would do uh, uh, the honors usually accorded to him and I said, I'd be happy to and I'm sure he'd be following and everyone would be disappointed he wasn't there. Well, I went, um, I did my duties. It was over fairly early. I guess that's why they're elite runners. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what an unusual day. It's, uh, I had hardly a single appointment. Um, I got a workout in, I got a haircut, and I was heading home um, actually to dig in the garden early. And uh, I got a call from our youngest daughter who was in Back Bay um, and said, Dad, I just heard a big boom coming from the direction of, the, of Boylston Street and everybody's running, what's going on? And I said, well, I'm not sure um, but don't worry about it, just stay out of the way. And uh, a couple minutes later, I got a call from our, um, uh, uh, our director of emergency management who happened to be down by the finish line uh, in the medical tent. And he said, something terrible has gone off. He said, I don't know if it's uh, an accident or something else, but you better get down here. And there was a whole debate 
with uh, the security team about whether I should go down there because, you know, this is the thing we forget. You know, today we think of two bombs, two guys, um, we know their backgrounds, we, you know, that's what we know now. Then we didn't. We didn't know how many people were involved. We didn't know whether it was a local, a national, an international incident. At the very beginning, we didn't know it was a bomb rather than a gas explosion or a manhole cover. We just knew there was uh, chaos and, uh, and damage and fear. Um, and that is the breach into which we all stepped. Well, tell us then at the beginning when you have all of these uncertainties and you don't know, first of all, the nature, as you say, of the explosion itself, where it came from, will there be more? Uh, is this a terrorist attack that, of course, certainly starting with 9-11, everything that would happen after that, we would all think, is this a terrorist attack? But I can remember, you know, even before that, going back to the first World Trade Center bombing or to the Oklahoma City bombing, we just marked the 25th anniversary of that, and that turned out to be domestic inspired terrorism. Um, so how do you, as a leader, a leader of a state, uh, pull together a, a rapid response team in rapid time? Well, first of all, we had practiced. Um, we'd had other, um, you know, real emergencies, tornadoes in Western and Western Massachusetts and ice storms and blizzards and so forth. We lost the uh, drinkable water uh, for the eastern half of the state when the water main exploded in Newton. Um, and we thought that was going to be, you know, we would have a boil water order in effect for several months, I think four or five months. We ultimately got that fixed in four or five days, I think it was. But um, we'd had a lot of that kind of practice with the same team of a uh, range of first responders. But we'd also done tabletop exercises with the joint domestic, uh, the joint terrorism task force, which involved federal, state, and local uh, law enforcement. And they and other resources all converged. We had to set up a command center, which we ultimately did in the Westin Hotel, just around the corner from the, from the bombing. That was its own drama. Um, but we had uh, all these resources and all this willingness to help. And the, uh, and the first issue was to organize who was going to do what, which meant we had to sort out what needed to be done. We had a crime scene that needed to be dealt with. We had runners who were out, um, you know, still on the course uh, when the race was stopped, who need to be, needed to be hydrated and oriented and reconnected with their families. Um, we had visitors from all over the world. We had uh, residents from the area uh, who weren't quite sure what they needed to do. And we had, we, we thought we might have an active attack underway. And so we triaged who was responsible for what. And though there were many agencies with overlapping responsibility, one of the things that I had learned from other experience uh, is that I had to have one point of contact for each of those, uh, each of those pieces. So we sorted that out pretty quickly. Um, and then we were communicating as much as we could with the, uh, uh, with the public, frankly, even when we didn't have answers to all of the questions, because that's what people seem to, uh, seem to need. Well, I can remember so well, I, I was uh, driving to a, a gala dinner the night that this all happened here in Charlottesville. We had had a, a lecture for my mentor here at the law school at UVA, and we were all just attuned to our radios. And then as soon as I got back from the dinner, turned on the television. And I can remember a sense of terror and fear all these many miles away. So I can't imagine what it was like uh, in the Boston area as you were searching for, very quickly it seemed that it narrowed down to a, a couple of, of what turned out to be the bombers, these two brothers, uh, and that uh, I can remember almost as if it, if it were fiction, you'd say, oh, well, you know, this could never happen, where a whole city the size of Boston has to shut down. Um, so what was that like to issue mm -hmm. a stay-at-home order? That sounds very familiar now. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned about coordination. I'm sure coordination within state agencies, but we hear an awful lot today about trying to coordinate all the three levels of our government in this country, local, state, and federal. And you must have been dealing with all three as well. That's right. We had, uh, we had every uh, federal uh, agency from you know Homeland Security to the Secret Service uh, available to us. 
We had uh, every state agency, of course, and then multiple local law enforcement and other uh, agencies. Because remember, the Boston Marathon is a regional event. It's not a it's not a city uh, only uh, event. And um, I would say, apart from the um, official activity, there was a very important um, piece of advice I got early on from my then chief of staff. Uh, about acknowledging and lifting up the individual and private acts of grace and kindness that we kept hearing about. Um, the ways that you know folks along the route would bring runners in to their homes, total strangers, hydrate them, warm them up, explain what had happened, and then work to connect them uh, again to their families or friends who were visiting in many cases from from out of town, how we created a place where everyone would know to go and find each other and a and develop the checklist. So we made sure everyone was accounted for. I'm talking about thousands of people. So much of that was personal. It was uh, it was everyone acting, neighbors acting like they were members of a common community. And acknowledging that and calling attention to it every time begat, um, if you will, uh, pardon the use of a uh, King James term, um, um, more of the same. And it was a part of our recovery and a part of our healing and an important part uh, as well. I think from the perspective of, the, of law enforcement, we had an agreement early that the FBI would lead the criminal investigation. Um, and we needed a lot of uh, information. And frankly, the public contributed to that as well with photographs and videos of the finish line, the areas where the, uh, where the bombs uh, went off. And it was the putting of all of that together that enabled us to identify these two um, terrorist needles in a haystack in about 100, uh, in 100 hours. The question of the shelter in place, so long way round to your question. <laughs> um, we didn't start there. You know, on, uh, I guess it was Thursday night, early Friday morning when during the, um, uh, after the shootout, um, the surviving suspect had escaped into a neighborhood in Watertown. And, um, at, and I was getting hourly briefings at this point and, and uh, it was maybe five o'clock or so when um, I was asked to shut down uh, or to suspend the, uh, the bus service that was about to start at six in and out of that neighborhood for fear that the suspect would get on the bus and, and, uh, and disappear. That was the only thing I was asked to do. I asked the question then, well, how long between the time this neighborhood was cordoned off and the time we lost track of the suspect? And they said, well, it was probably a couple of hours. And I said, well, how far could he have gotten in that period of time. And we talked about the surrounding communities. So we asked the surrounding communities to, I mean, that was the plan to ask just the surrounding communities or neighborhoods to shelter in place. I was on my way to Watertown to announce that just before six, when we learned three or four other pieces of information. One was that there was a person in a, there was a taxi stopped in the Fenway with a person meeting the um, identify the description of the suspect in the back seat and a potential explosive device in the trunk. So that was one piece of information. We got another piece of information that the, that the federal court officers down at the U.S. District Court in the Seaport were in pursuit of, uh, of a person who met the description of the suspect. We got the information that the JFK Library was on fire. And then we tracked a, uh, a taxi that had picked up a fare around the time in Watertown that the authorities lost track of the suspect they were pursuing and brought him to the early train to New York from South Station. And that train had departed uh, on its way to New York. And so all of a sudden, we didn't know what we were dealing with, how many different, and that was the reason to ask regionally that people shelter in place until we could sort this out. Um, we also ordered the, um, I didn't even know I could do this, but the Amtrak train to stop and be searched outside of, uh, outside of New Haven. Um, so lots of, this is the nature of these things. It's frankly very like, it, well, somewhat like what we're dealing with today. 
You never have enough information, Barbara. And, um, and the information you have is imperfect, but you still have to make decisions. Um, and trying to explain as much of that as was prudent to the public, I think was another important part of the cooperation we got from the, um, uh, from the public. Well, Governor, when people are so frightened in, as in a situation such as this, and you're asking them to do difficult things, how does a leader engender trust? in that leadership and trust in the, in the people to do the right thing. But I think in, in some ways, much more important that they have trust in that leader and in that leadership to make those hard decisions with, as you say, imperfect and incomplete information at the time in real time. It's a very important and, Im and impossible question um, because I don't think that this, in our case, was a success created just in that moment. In other words, we had a relationship with the people of Massachusetts. We had a relationship with the officials and with the ordinary folks. And I, I hope they had come, uh, and I, I, I hope they had come to trust that I was gonna tell the truth, that I wasn't going to exaggerate or underestimate uh, and undervalue. I hope they understood that, um, well, I thought it was important that I, I be the cool head in all of this, not, not unfeeling about the fear and the trauma um, and, the, and the violence uh, that had just been visited on us, but um, that you know, decisions still had to be made in the midst of, of that, and they needed to count on me to keep my head and in that way to kind of model that behavior for the others who were contributing to the decisions we had to, uh, to make. And then the last thing I would say is, you know, from the first time I ran, the point I've been making is, um, uh, is a point about having grown up in a neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, where we were taught, where we were under the jurisdiction, every child of every adult on the block. So if you messed up down the street in front of Ms. Jones, she'd straighten you out as if you were hers and then call home, right? What those adults were teaching us, I believe, is that membership in community is understanding you have a stake in your neighbor's dreams and struggles, as well as your own, that we belong to each other. And it was um, the importance of reinventing and rebuilding that sense of common cause and, uh, and common destiny that would have to be the framework for all of the decisions we were, uh, we were making in, uh, in our administration, whether they were uh, more run-of-the-mill policy decisions or emergency decisions of this kind. Well, one, one last question for you, Governor, before we turn back to Rachel, who I believe has uh, a question uh, that was uh, put forward by some of the people who have joined us today. Um, and that is, uh, in this time of polarization, uh, and, and even 2008, 2013 uh, seems so long ago, um, because yeah. we truly are in a time of, of polarization, not the first time in our country, to be sure, uh, but how does the leader find unity of purpose uh, and, again, engender trust when people are so polarized and so mistrustful, not only of leadership, but leadership in all realms, in the media, in science, in medicine, uh, in the military? How, how does a leader uh, inspire and be inclusive in the way that President Kennedy was? Well, I think, you know, this is, of course, the question of the hour, isn't it? And the question of the times. Um, and it's deeply concerning uh, to me because, you know, um, first of all, some of what we are experiencing today um, happened by design. Some of the undermining of institutions, the way we demean um, those who differ um, in opinion or, uh, or political persuasion or something rather than uh, uh, simply, you know, challenging uh, and, uh, and comparing uh, our, our uh, respective points of view. Um, how, um, you know, it turns out a lot of democracy uh, depends on unwritten rules, doesn't it? Uh, rules about decorum and restraint uh, and uh, respect um, and, um, uh, and of course, if you add to that the complexity of, um, of our lives today and of our society uh, today can be quite overwhelming and it leaves uh, people kind of throwing up their hands and we are encouraged to throw up our hands and say, you know, 
who should we believe? We can't really count on anything. To me, it's a fundamentally un-American outcome. And what was marvelous and still to me so compelling about President Kennedy is that he reminded us as Americans that we have had a tradition of shaping our own future. That is imagining what we want our destiny to be and then reaching for it. Uh, and more often than not having that reach exceed our grasp. That I think is exactly what we are uh, called upon to do right now. And frankly, what we have the opportunity to do right now. What uh, coronavirus um, has done alongside the, um, the uh, medical or healthcare terror that we are all uh, uh, experiencing, um, it has exposed um, an awful lot of chronic neglect over the years around hunger and housing and homelessness and poverty and, uh, uh, and, uh, and health uh, disparities and so forth. And it would be a shame if um, we didn't see this moment uh, as an opportunity um, to be bold in how we speak to and address and ultimately fix those challenges as we come out of, uh, of this pandemic, and we will come out of this um, pandemic. We will indeed. Well, with that, uh, Rachel, I believe, is going to join us, and uh, she has a question to pose at the end here. Sure. Sure. Thank you, Governor Patrick and Dr. Perry, so much for this conversation. For a last question, um, how can we best continue these conversations and respond moving forward? Um, can you each give us a sense of how you'd have your, your best advice for that? Well, I'm going to defer to Governor Patrick to go first, and, and then I'll bring, bring us uh, in as an anchor. I was going to say the same thing so that I have a oh. chance to think about the question. It's a tough oh, well, question. I, I tell you, I'm ready to go in case you're not. Well, let, let, me just, let me just say, I think, you know, in some ways, um, the last thing we need in this country is a reason to isolate ourselves. You know, that, that's kind of part of the challenge uh, right now. Um, but using tools of this kind and old fashioned tools like a postcard even and everything in between, we need to be figuring out how to reach out to each other, to reconnect with each other in more than the hasty, uh, you know, tweets that have become such a regular uh, part of our uh, communication uh, diet. Because at the end of the day, until we learn again, to turn to each other rather than on each other until we learn again that we have a stake in our neighbor's dreams and struggles as well as our own, um, then I think um, we aren't gonna fully understand that that is the foundation for, all, for meeting all of the big challenges uh, before us. It's the same call to the American character that uh, President Kennedy was about. And, uh, and I love the idea that uh, the library and foundation um, are refreshing that um, for this moment because it comes right on time. It does. So my last point will be to follow uh, in, in, the, in the governor's suggestion. Um, I'm taking a page from uh, President Kennedy's mother, Rose. Mm -hmm. uh, and Rose Kennedy kept a a day book such as this or a journal. And I know a lot of my younger colleagues I see at the office uh, at Miller Center at UVA have these. And so when we have these conversations, and I'm so excited that the Kennedy Library will continue with these now on New Frontier Fridays, but Rose Kennedy would write down when she listened to a conversation such as this, or she'd read an interesting article, she'd write down a quote or an inspiration mm -hmm. uh, or a question that she wanted to ask. And of course, then she was famous for posing those questions and, and challenging her children at the dinner table. So we're all together as families, or uh, if our families and friends are far flung, we can continue these conversations. We can continue them around the dinner table. We can continue them uh, on our video chats and in our phone calls, maybe reaching out to family members and friends that we haven't talked to for a while. And we can pass some of this inspiration on to our public officials and I'll end with uh, President Kennedy's comment that in a democracy, every citizen holds public office. So with that, I will turn back 
uh, to Rachel. But again, thank okay. you, Governor, so much. Thank for you, Barbara. Us. That was wonderful. Been an inspiration. Thank you. And thank you both so much. This was just such a wonderful conversation with you today. We're so pleased to have had the opportunity to hear from both of you. Um, as President Kennedy shared with us in 1960, and a thought that I think you've really renewed for us today, that we are not here to curse the darkness, but to light the candle that can guide us through that darkness to a safe and sane future. And for all of those watching, thank you too. Um, we invite you to share your thoughts and feedback on this format or this concept um, at NFN at JFK Library Foundation, um, JFKLFoundation.org, sorry. And we hope that you'll join us for our next program. All of us at the Kennedy Library Foundation hold you and your loved ones in our thoughts and sincerely hope that you are healthy, remain healthy, and look forward to the day that we can welcome you back to the Kennedy Library on Columbia Point. Thank you all. Thank you.